Welcome, everyone. So this afternoon's session just has a small title, Sustainability, Talent, Technology, and quite simply this afternoon, we're going to talk about future-proofing Australia. So welcome. I'd like to uh, welcome the panel members. I'll start in the middle with Roy Green. Roy is the Dean of the UTS Business School, and UTS is the University of Technology, Sydney, locally. Uh, Roy has very published in the areas of innovation, policy and management. He's currently also not just New South Wales, he's very much Australian. He's working uh, for the Queensland Competition Authority, Roy. He must tell us more about that. But importantly, right now, he is an advisor to the Senate Innovation System Inquiry. So I think you'll share a bit of what we should and shouldn't be doing, Roy. To Roy's left, we have Russell Howard. Russell's the chairman of the board of New Clone. He's the head of commercial strategy at Kinghorn Centre for Clinical Genomics. So we're going genomics. to see genomics, because it's a new word for me. But importantly, Russell won the 2013 Advanced Global Australian Biotechnology Award, and he's working in one of the most advanced areas of research commercialisation. And to my left, we have Cameron Hepburn, co-founder of Climate Bridge, and the two active businesses, Vivid Economics and Aurora Energy. Uh, in, in kind of keeping with the advanced theme, tonight you'll get the award. So Cameron won uh, the award for essentially clean technology. So he'll go, he's going to talk a little bit about future-proofing Australia in that area, but also congratulations, Cameron, and you're not just a shy, introverted Oxford Don that you said you were earlier. So in a bit of a briefing, I go to the CSIRO, our scientific entity, and it noted that while innovation is defined broadly as the process of translating an idea or an invention into a good or service that creates value, and for which a customer will pay, it's not an end in itself. It is a means to an end. The end can be a broad range of economic, social and environmental benefits that drive national well-being, prosperity and development. So we love innovation. Roy, the OECD has stated that capability to innovation and to bring innovation successfully to the market, it's crucial um, that we have global competitiveness. So I suppose there's a, a link between what's the importance of design thinking, approach in education. Are we seeing that our education industry is supportive? And does Australia have a bright future? Are we future-proof? What do you want to say about innovation and education? Well, thank you, Maria. Wonderful to be, the, be in this room too, which is one of the finest in this building. Uh, I think the CSIRO definition of innovation is about right, and you've asked a lot of questions about that. Um, I'd just say it's ideas applied successfully, as simple as that. Uh, not the ideas themselves, because Australia has a wealth of ideas, but do we, do we apply them successfully? That's the question. And um, Larry Marshall, the new uh, director of the CSIRO, is fond of quoting this statistic, which is that we are seventh in the world in the production of research ideas, but we're number 81 in the efficiency with which we translate those ideas into commercial or social outcomes. And I think that's the serious capability gap that we face in Australia, and that's the, uh, one of the terms of reference of the Senate Innovation System Inquiry. Now, every, everyone could be rather cynical about another innovation inquiry. We, we worked out that we've had 60 of these uh, run by the Commonwealth in the last 15 years. Uh, but um, 1 to 60 um, were conducted during a period of economic boom. Uh, but we're beyond that now. So number 61 is applying itself with a great deal of, of a sense of purpose because in the post mining boom economy, we're going to have to find new sources of growth and productivity. That's, terms of trade have now moved against us. If anyone heard Chris Richardson this morning on the radio, uh, we're, we're facing serious uh, uh, challenges to our national income. Uh, we, if you've seen the Treasury graph on this, uh, we were able to disguise our deteriorating productivity performance over the last few years 
by um, the massive windfall revenues from um, our commodities, uh, which added 15 per cent to our standard of living here without us ha actually having to go to any extra effort. That uh, was even without the investment in the, in the mining industry. Uh, that's all come to an end and it's really exposed our deficiencies as a country, at least in terms of our productivity performance and our failure to diversify, uh, our failure to, to, to generate complexity uh, in our economy. We're still very much, uh, it, uh, it's not something people like to hear, uh, but we, we do have a third world economic structure here in relation to our reliance on unprocessed raw materials, uh, which is fine when the prices are high, as they have been in periods of our history, uh, but at the end of each boom, we are scrambling to find new sources of growth. Other countries have had the same issue facing them. Uh, the Dutch in the 1960s had the so-called Dutch disease. This is where it really started when uh, North Sea gas drove up the price of the Gilder and made their manufacturing industry uncompetitive for about a decade until they restructured their economy. Uh, the British had the same thing. The uh, advent of North Sea oil uh, meant that... Um, they were able to provide massive tax cuts to the uh, community. It uh, kept the government in office for a uh, 10 to 15 year period. Uh, but uh, did it add anything to the uh, structure of the British economy? At the end of the 1980s, people were driving around BMWs, but they wondered what had happened to the health and education system. Infrastructure had not been invested in. The one country that has done this well is uh, Norway, uh, which um, had a similar experience with North Sea Oil. It, uh, however, at the policy level, uh, took a public stake in Stat Oil. It uh, created a sovereign wealth fund. Mm -hmm. It applied not a 20% or 40%, but a 76% resource rent tax. Mm -hmm. And now it has a dividend that it applies to its future research and innovation infrastructure. We've missed all that. Mm -hmm. uh, we've squandered the boom, mm -hmm. but it's I'm never too late to start. Mm -hmm. yes. Never too late to start. And that's the purpose of this uh, inquiry, uh, to create a bipartisan solution, uh, not something that one government will use against uh, an opposition, but a bipartisan policy position which will enable us to build capability, our skills, our education, but not only that, also uh, the absorptive capacity of our enterprises because we can uh, supply as many skills or ideas as we wish but it is our businesses, our enterprises, whether business, whether private or social, that have to pick these up. Mm -hmm. So before I move to Cameron, I, I want a kind of thumb indicator for... You're really sitting there with the cultural pulse of the talent pool. So it's those in undergraduates, postgraduates, but it's also UTS is offering next year that mm. entrepreneurial masters, the mm. EMBA, MBA program mm. for all of us that want to go and facilitate mm. innovation getting commercialised. So are we kind of thumb neutral? Are we in good shape with that talent pool or are we behind? I think we've got a very uh, talented population. Um, I think by any... Uh, world standards, uh, we produce uh, good graduate outcomes, but are they in the right places? Because what we're going to see in the labour market over the next few years is a big bifurcation between those skills that become increasingly commoditised, in other words, ones that are going to be offshored or automated or devalued by low-cost competition, and those skills which are unique, which are impossible to replicate, uh, which define us as a country, in other words, uh, skills based on what we call boundary crossing skills, creativity, problem solving. And those are the kind of skills that we need to generate in our graduates. We're very good on uh, most of the technical skills, although you know, we often hear that we're falling behind in STEM, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. But um, we are, in fact, world competitive in those areas. Uh, we may not have enough of them, but we're certainly world competitive in the ones that we create where we're not and where we need to prepare more is in these boundary crossing areas where we need to prepare for jobs that don't currently exist. Mm -hmm. uh, the Oxford Martin Institute, um, an institution that we mm. uh, quoted in a recent CEDA report, Australia's Future Workforce, has uh, suggested and, uh, on very good data that half the jobs that currently exist won't exist in 10 years' time. So we need to prepare for jobs that are not there. And uh, that's really where UTS is positioning itself um, in relation not to current jobs but where the future will be. We, we say to our young 
undergraduates, when they come in now, um, you may uh, not only work in um, a, a, a business in the next street in our emerging creative digital precinct around UTS, where we have, by the way, three times the density of entrepreneurial startup activity compared with the next ranked area in Australia, but it's a job that you may create for yourself in one of the incubators or co-working spaces. Mm -hmm. And the important thing there is that we connect what you do to value creation across the economy, including in um, advanced manufacturing, which is an area that uh, we've somewhat let go in the last few years. Mm -hmm. um, and at the graduate level, um, as Maria has pointed out, um, we're we've, we've launched and are introducing in 2016 a new type of MBA, which goes beyond the rather standard quality MBAs that currently exist, uh, which is based on entrepreneurship. And it, it's uh, uh, an MBA where uh, the participants will be able to take an idea from concept to reality within the space of the MBA, uh, with three distinct modules that can be taken at any time in any order, uh, and use it, not, not sort of taking people on a tour to Silicon Valley, but bringing Silicon Valley to Sydney, because we've got to take the view that Sydney is the centre of the of the known universe. If we don't have that sense of confidence, we won't get anywhere. Fabulous, Roy. So Cameron, I mean, we have to address the elephant in the room on a sustainability report card for Australia. So um, your talent living abroad, your business is growing, you're establishing offices um, throughout Europe, but you closed the Melbourne office. So a little bit of background on where you're seeing your skills in carbon abatement, in adaptation, in uh, economics indicator, in big data and analytics around energy transformation. Your business is hot. I mean, it's a great place to be investing, but not a Melbourne office. Thanks for the nice, easy starting uh, <laughs> question. I appreciate that. Well, we might as well just that's, you know, that's, smack that's the great. elephant and move on. <laughs> All right, well, I'll, I'll give it a big pat on the backside and say that, uh, look, uh, so I've um, now co-founded three, three businesses. Um, one of them was uh, Shanghai headquartered with the Melbourne office. Um, that one was based on reducing greenhouse gas emissions using various market-based instruments that existed around the world. We had a big London office, a Munich office, and and when, you know, uh, a hypothetical country gets rid of a, uh, an emissions trading scheme, there's just not much for that business to do mm. anymore. And mm. when another hypothetical country, a very big one, just up north, um, starts going full steam ahead on uh, carbon pricing, um, mm. you know, we had board meetings where the Chinese team were just wondering what the, what the Aussies and the, and the Westerners were on about because all they mm. saw was immense opportunity. So mm. there was a... You know, an economic rationale and a logic, and, and off you go. Mm. And uh, there's no doubt that, you know, as, as with any new space, the countries that are able to grab the bull both horns and to implement policy that enables early, you know, businesses to get a toehold then allows them to go global. Mm. But look, having said that, uh, the business had uh, Australian investors uh, my most recent one has Australian investors, mm -hmm. um, some from the kind of eastern island over there as well, with a funny, ac even funnier accent than my accent. Uh, and what I find, th going back to the, the human capital side of the ledger and to the talent, is that um, yeah, I'm, I'm privileged, privileged to be sitting here, but privileged at Oxford to have you know, the best and brightest from around the world, great Americans and Russians and Europeans to mm -hmm. hire. Uh, and that there is still something about an Australian on your team that is irreplaceable. There's the, the can-do attitude, the positive approach, and just it's uh, Australians punch above their weight in, mm -hmm. uh, in, in many respects and including in helping me, at least, to translate those mm -hmm. ideas into... Reality, and I'm sure there's some selection bias and some other things uh, in my small data set, but uh, I think there's a lot to be said for the, for the human capital of this country. Can I just pick up on one other thing Roy said. I think, um, I think we would be not just in much better shape if we'd learnt some of the lessons from Norway, but if we thought about 
our economic system in terms of its wealth. So one of the, the research programs I have going on at Oxford is, is a program on wealth. And when you look at the economy through the lens of the wealth that is either created or destroyed, rather than the gross output in any year that is produced, you come to very different conclusions. You don't conclude that converting your natural capital, your oil and gas and your mineral wealth into financial wealth is some piece of income. It's not. You're selling one asset, you're buying mm -hmm. another one. That's not, that's not wealth creating. It's not necessarily income mm -hmm. creating. It can be when you add value. It can be, and it is in other ways. I'm not denying that. But I think we'd have, we would have had a much less blinkered view, perhaps, of the mm -hmm. progress of the Australian economy through the, through the boom period if we'd had this, the, what I see as the correct lens to look mm -hmm. at it, which is that we're just in, engaged in a process of asset conversion mm -hmm. rather than in you know, seriously genuine mm -hmm. wealth mm -hmm. creation. So mm -hmm. I, uh, I, I hope we'll be looking at wealth indicators in the future, and that's what, that's what we we're working do. on. Let's yeah. show our hands, yes, please. Mm -hmm. So something broader than the GDP, mm -hmm. something more meaningful. So keep employing those Aussies overseas. Um, Growth in markets like Germany, where we've got kind of <coughs> transformation of energy systems occurring mm -hmm. right now. Do mm -hmm. you see those skill sets required in Australia? Are, are we going to be at a point where that's the kind of initiative that will future-proof Australia? Yeah, for sure. I mean, Germany is so interesting right now because they have had this energy vendor. They've uh, taken out their nukes. They're pushing really hard on renewables. Uh, they've had this perverse consequence of the U.S. shale boom in that they're now burning more coal and they've got to manage that and keep their emissions down. But the, the energy system there and in California is going through this major seismic shift. The biggest utility, RWE, is, you know, could well be bankrupt by 2020. The next biggest, E.ON, is just the CEO, Johannes Tyson, has done a major restructure. And this is what Australia's got in front of it, I think. I mean, it, it is... It is to me, obvious that we will go down this path given the resource base that we've got, mm -hmm. a phenomenal renewable resource base, and that will disrupt your power markets. And so managing that process, mm -hmm. it need not, but it probably will, unless you, under, you understand how the, you know, I don't want to get too technical, but how renewable energy is, is low marginal cost, high fixed cost, intermittent, you know, you need to understand the structure of the the market and your capacity to make sure that it all works. And so hopefully in a few years' time we can take some of the skills and the modelling approaches that we're, we're using to, to deliver intelligence in the UK and in Germany back here. So we'll, we'll open, a, open another Aussie office. Wonderful. Cameron, thank you. I'm going to come back to that. So, Russell, um, I mean, really, I'm going, to, I'm going to really go to the area where you said that you have a dream of having a Prime Minister who regularly demands public updates on how Australia's innovators uh, are going in addressing key challenges and priorities. Mm -hmm. You are clear in the biotech life science uh, groundbreaking research, 34 years over in the US. You came back to Australia three years ago. We'll talk about that year in the wilderness as well mm -hmm. um, and what advance and everyone in the room can do to ensure that's not repeated for others. Mm -hmm. But importantly in your area of research, you know, a full human genome sequence which cost 100 million, I'm not making that up, 100 million in 2002, today can be done for about $1,000, and the prediction is that it'll be done for less than a cup of coffee by 2020. Tell us about your research, your area, and, uh, and also yeah. whether the innovation in coming back home, you're not going to leave us, are you, Russell? So, uh, thank you for the, <laughs> <laughs> for the introduction. Maybe if I tell a little story, it will illustrate what I see as the problem and opportunity. So, for myself, after 34 years in the US, doing things for which I was never trained at Melbourne University in both research and in, um, in business and creating companies, selling companies, buying companies, through all of that time and coming back to Australia, I now have a tremendous opportunity here. After a year in the wilderness, I am now working harder than ever before. I was the CEO of a NASDAQ-listed company in technology, having a great time. I'm now working harder than ever before and working for two jobs, each of them 24-7, and helping four other companies. And so I'm incredibly challenged and busy and 
in wonderment at what I'm doing. And the reason is we have no dearth of innovation here. We do not need, with apologies, any other discussion on innovation. It's here. We do not need a discussion on is the money here. There's lots of money here, but it's not liberated appropriately. In between, we have a problem, and it was mentioned this morning. I think it's the people to help drag that innovation into technology, into product, and commercialise it using money from anywhere in the world. And to give an illustration of what I'm doing now, I came into a company that was a, a start-up that was created by a woman who, out of University of New South Wales, had a technology idea. For seven years, she tried to grow that company on federal grants. She mortgaged her house twice and almost went out of money for a whole family. I dropped out of the sky and in five minutes discussion with her, as an opportunist and knowing a lot about technology and seeing a lot of things in biotech come and go, I recognised in five minutes that she had a technology that I was prepared to put my own money in and two days a week in, a week in and become executive chairman with. And in three days of working and talking with her, I said, I should join your company, we should do great things together. And what did I do? Simply because by osmosis, never with any business training, by osmosis I knew what to do and what not to do in business. I'm a science guy. But I knew that in discussions with a major international company that had been courting her for four years unsuccessfully and pissing around with let's work on one biotech product, I sat down with them when they came and within a day had them convinced we should work on 10 products and we should put half our money and half their money and we would take on half of the global opportunity space. That's what we're doing. And what does it offer us? Instead of deals that she could have done that would have destroyed value, we now have a channel to an international market. We've carved the world in two like the Portuguese and the Spanish. And we have access to one of the largest global um, biologicals producers in the world. And it's not because I'm a genius. It's because I had been trained not to sit and to sell the farm. Mm. I, in the US, had a brilliant team around me. And we consummated about 50 commercial deals in two years at the same time as I took a company public and bought a company and sold two companies. And by osmosis, as a guy with agile mind, I learned how to do stuff, and then I'm in shock when I sit in Australia and see things go wrong. So we simply need 1,000 or 2,000 women and men like me who see the opportunity back here. And for me, it's a tremendous opportunity because I'm creating value. I'm back in the country where I do feel that I should be giving back, I only went through university because of the largesse of the Australian taxpayer. So I'm back having a great time and I feel that I'm able to give. And it does take time. It took me a year in the wilderness to meet people who across the other side of the table said, oh, Russell, my God, we need you and you could help us. And there was that admission of mutual respect and across the table we'll do something together. So I'm doing that in this field of biosimilar monoclonals and in a completely different field, I'm at the Garvin Institute working on commercialization of human genome sequencing. So there's a tremendous opportunity here. There's so much innovation, there's lots of money and we've just raised six million for this little company entirely from high net worths in Sydney. Mm -hmm. People who know nothing about the life sciences that we've convinced as lawyers, bankers, accountants to put their good money into our company. <coughs> So the money is here or internationally, the innovation is here, we need lots of people either homegrown or overseas who do not sell the farm early and cheap. So another elephant in the room, life sciences. I'm an angel investor, if we look at our portfolio everyone, you'll go and download your pie and see what portion of your investment pie includes life sciences. Mm -hmm. Now the reputation of life sciences is high capital, mm -hmm. long tail right. for conversion, high risk for commercialisation and return mm -hmm. on investment. Right. True, not true? That's true, and in any portfolio, one has a range of investments. So to come to fruition, a part of the life sciences, drug discovery and development, takes 10 years, 500 million or more. So that should only be a small part of one's portfolio. But this field that I'm now entering is at the intersection of the ICT world uh, and devices and biotech, and that's sequencing the human genome, having the information in a database, accessing it with devices under appropriate security control, and a ripple effect across the entire ecosystem. And so w without too much bravado, I believe 
there will be a new genomics healthcare ecosystem in Australia. It's already way ahead in the United States. If you look up genomic health and Google it in the US, there are tens of companies today at this intersection, and I will say we have the chance in Australia to build our own ecosystem. So it won't be that long time. It'll be an ecosystem with apps, with service industries, with tourist medicine and everything that goes around that, with insurance industries, with um, control of information, databases and healthcare and clinical work. All of that is a whole new ecosystem based on personalised medicine of your genome tells the secrets about how you should be treated, how you should not be treated, what diseases you should worry about in the next decade, etc. And that's all happening in the US now and I will tell you Boldly, we in Australia are equal to the best in the world right now in this very industry. Top three. Absolutely. So I'm getting a really strong thumbs up, but I want to hear about when you return 2012 12. Mm. to Australia. Lots of cups of coffee, lots of chats. In fact, you said a year in the wilderness. Yes. So why? Why when we had this talent, this opportunity, we're cutting edge, we need the skill set and network for commercialisation, why did we leave you for a year and what mm. was the catalyst As for mentioned it? in the last panel, it was my own fault and that was I was living in the United States for 34 years. I had a family there, a whole life there and my future was in the US and it was only because of personal circumstances, life change that I decided to come back to Australia. And coming back, I had not nurtured any of the relationships. I mean, it's expensive and time consuming to come back to Australia every year when you're away for 34 years. You don't do it. And so I didn't have that network and I went through a year of trying to introduce myself to people and without bravado, just sort of, here's what I can do, how can I help you, etc. And it took a year and then it was the Advance Award. And I, I have told this to the board of Advance. This is the tragedy. I was tapped on the shoulder by the Advance Award. The next day I was offered to be a non-executive director in a company. The next week I was sitting at ATP and uh, after an introduction in five minutes decided with this CEO, this woman, we should do something together. So it was the tap on the shoulder of, oh my, you're not a complete idiot and you've fallen out of the sky and now we'll talk to you and you're serious. And so that's tragic. <coughs> How can it be that I had a year of wasted time and I know that this happens in other businesses? It's not just myself as a life science guy. I've, I met last night an accountant banker and he told me that exactly the same happened to him. So we have a problem in that we people fall out of the sky because we've been overseas growing our lives and consumed by the wonderful jobs we have overseas. We come back and we haven't got a network. That is, in this day of data and interchange, a solvable problem. We have to fix that, and that's just obvious. So maybe Advance could think about a fund that we could all invest in, knowing that there's a talent pool. Um, is there anything that you think Advance, its members, um, should be doing to enable that one year of... I, th I think my opportunity, the fact that I am having such an incredible time, after a year... That year should be turned into one month, um, and after that, I'm having a wonderful time in my life. And I truly believe I'm helping these companies. It, I am finding myself, oh my God, I can do this. Uh, and I should also point out a little saying I have. In the United States, I was one tadpole in a gigantic pond. There are many brilliant people in my industry in the United States and people with whose careers on paper look, you know, ten times better than mine. So over there I was a successful tadpole in a big pond. Here, the pond hasn't got a tadpole in it. You can be a frog. Really. It's a totally different world. I find myself with a bunch of talent that other people haven't got here. And so that's the opportunity for people in the United States to say, come back and be a frog. <laughs> Cameron? Want to come back and be a frog? The mentoring program is, is very important. So this yeah. link that you're mentoring, um, and I want to talk about women. So, mm -hmm. um, I don't know, 25% of businesses in the US, are s s startup businesses are women-led, but they get 3% of the venture capital funding. So mm -hmm. there's obviously some problem there. The life sciences, often women in science without the confidence to run the business and spread the technology investment. Roy, you see it all the time. But, but Cameron, with this mentoring, um, can it be helpful for you through the advanced network to be mentoring you, but also is it a distraction right now because you've got so much on in a similar way to the other two gentlemen that you don't have time for the give back? 
Uh, no, I, look, I think it's, um, there's a great book actually by a Wharton professor of psychology uh, called Give and Take. If you haven't read it, read it I suggest you do. Uh, uh, there's no point about not having time to giving back because mm -hmm. when you're giving your, well, it's not as if you're taking, but it's, mm -hmm. it's just what you, I mean, you just do it anyway. So I've, I've just agreed to mentor an advanced person and Ooh. I'll look forward to doing that. Thank and you. I'd mentor a few people uh, in the UK too. Um, I think this question about maintaining networks at home mm -hmm. while, you're, while you're away and coming back, I'm not sure I want to be a frog. I do speak French and we, uh, <laughs> we have a couple of frogs in the house over in the UK. But um, uh, I've been back at least once every year. You might ask what happened to my accent, but you know, I've, it's four times a year in some cases. Mm -hmm. um, but I've now got two kids, and I am honestly asking myself how much longer can this mm. go on for? Uh, and we, we will see whether I could... I make, had three. Yeah, <laughs> see, see whether I could make 34 years. Well, um, one of the mm. scholars I worked with at Oxford to set up the institute I'm in, Michael Spence, um, came back, and as I guess many of you will know here, he now... Mm -hmm. uh, I, well, unless something's changed while well, I've been away the last few months, but I think he's still no. running Sydney. No, he's still there. Um, he, he said to me he had a, I'm not sure it was a year in the wilderness, but a kind mm -hmm. of reverse culture shock of some mm -hmm. kind when he, when he got back. I'm not sure if he wanted me to share this in public. Sorry, Michael. <laughs> uh, he's a very genteel and nice chap. But, uh, but you can understand it when, you, when you've been away for perhaps you know, more than half of your adult life. Mm -hmm. You don't think you need some re-assimilation program because you're going home. Mm -hmm would never occur to me to think that I needed to kind of mm. check back in and, and work out what's going on back home because it's back home. But uh, actually, I think that's, that's quite a good reframing, that you're almost going into another culture because mm. maybe it's moved on or maybe you've moved on and you kind of need to reorient. Mm. So, mm. Russell, I'm not sure about the whole one-month thing. I think that's over-optimistic. I mean, even if you're transitioning between mm. jobs in the same culture, it could take you three well, months. It, uh, what I should months, have so. done, and I, I, I agree... Um, I think maybe six months to a year or even longer before coming back, the person should be forward planning. And that's when we can help them and connect with them. Mm -hmm. And some people come back with parents overnight, they've got to make a decision. But most of us would like to think that we could plan a year ahead. And yeah. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. So, Roy, you're giving up time with Vance. You're a big commitment to the networks where you travel overseas and award graduates, postgraduates, undergraduates um, in foreign countries with UTS qualifications. You have a sophisticated alumni program. Is mm. there something in this about not losing the individuals and then facilitating the hook when they come back and supporting them? Is there something universities should be doing? Yeah, I think that's a very important part of uh, what we do. We have the head of our alumni program in the audience today, Roseanne Hunt. Um, we're working with Advance on the prospect of uh, a mentoring program. Um, it's something that we tried to get the last government to do uh, around the Enterprise Connect program, which is about building uh, SMEs in Australia and getting them to be more globalised. It's now transitioned to the Entrepreneurs Program, um, still finding its feet. But the idea there was, how do we do what the Israelis do, uh, the Irish do, mm. Uh, that is, um, position our businesses abroad um, in a much more concerted and clever way than we have thus far. My sons, when they look at uh, Clive James, for example, if they watch an interview with him, they sort of say, well, what planet did he come from? Mm. Well, that was the planet we were all brought up in, actually. Mm. Stone uh, the Crows. <laughs> exactly, as we were saying earlier. Um, we don't want... I mean... Clive and many other Australians abroad have been very successful uh, and they do give back to Australia in their own way. But um, it, we have much more mobility now. Mm. Um, if you look, for example, at the young people coming out of <coughs> Ireland, uh, it's been through its own difficulties. Um, I was in Ireland for five years. I went there because they wanted me to turn a, uh, a traditional faculty of commerce into an international business school. And I came back um, after that... Um, really for personal reasons, but I, I could have stayed. Uh, I was enjoying it greatly. Now, of course, the tables have turned and um, the Irish economy um, hit the skids, partly because of the bloated uh, finance and property sectors. It really created its own subprime crisis. It did it to itself. Uh, but beneath all that is a very active and successful 
technology sector. It's not Greece. Greece didn't, doesn't have an economy to speak of. Ireland does. It's got a very strong base in science and technology, uh, and that's uh, facilitated by wonderful programs like Science Foundation Ireland. We can learn a lot from them. But the point I want to make here is that with the turndown in the Irish economy, thousands of Irish young people, very highly qualified, came to Australia and many of them work in menial jobs. But it's not like the previous exit from Ireland in the 1980s mm. or in the 1950s, uh, when if you left Ireland, that was it. You were unlikely to go back. And uh, there are stories of people holding what are the equivalent what would be seen as the equivalent of funerals for those of their kids who exited uh, the country because they knew they would never see them again. Uh, those days are well and truly over. Uh, in the age of the internet, Facebook, social media, these kids are thoroughly plugged into the innovation ecosystem in Ireland. And at the first sign of the upturn, which is now happening, by the way, uh, Dublin, Galway, other places are really picking up, uh, largely through a combination of foreign direct investment companies and uh, local SMEs in the technology space, ICT, medtech. These kids are now flooding back. Mm. Uh, and um, that's the kind of ecosystem we need to create mm -hmm. here, whereby mm -hmm. we can send our kids abroad, we can send our businesses abroad, but they keep a connection. They're not going to go overseas, get venture capital, and then never Thanks, return. Roy. So I didn't answer your question. And that was the PM that I want. Oh, yes, I want a PM. the dreaming. Yeah, the PM, the PM that I want. We're out of time, but Russell, no, this is the perfect we want a PM. <laughs> we want a PM who will, of course, think about re-election, but for their personal ego satisfaction and benefit to the world, they want to leave something for Australia that they know will take 25 years. We all know that any big program is going to take 20, 25 years, whether it's in education at the bottom or whether it's capturing people who are now. Nice. And so somehow we need a politician that says, I want the credit for starting this program and I know I'm going to be out of here in four years. And I, I find it unimaginable that we can't find a person with the self-interest and the stamp on history to have a program like the space program in the US or whatever that says, we in Australia are going to convert all of that land, yep. all of that water, all of that sunshine into the world's agribusness. So or we we're going need, to convert we the life science talents. We yeah. need to vote for that person for the long term. Exactly. That's a nice mm. personal responsibility. Mm. I didn't take questions because I knew the talent that was on the um, panel this afternoon. So please join with me in the traditional way of thanking them. Thank you. Cameron, Roy and Russell. Thank you.